first we'll start off with what is a VOC? So these are your volatile organic compounds. They include your fuels, your degreasers, your heat transfer fluids, paints, solvents. You guys can typically know that you're dealing with a VOC because it's got that certain smell to it. Uh, it's the chemical compounds that keep inter industry going and most of your hazmat incidents are VOC related. And so now you guys have a tool that can give you a measurement on that. We measure VOCs with our PID, which is our photo ionization detector. It's just a sensor in your instrument. It's the best method to detect a wide range of VOCs and toxic gases, and it can measure in part per million, and we also have some models that can read down to part per billion. So again, remember, imagining dividing this room into a billion squares, we can measure one of those squares if we had a part per billion VOC sensor, okay? So over 90% of your hazmat calls are gonna be fuel related, and so your PID is just gonna be the perfect sensor to make that call, okay? So PID uses in hazmat, there's a lot of different things that you can do with this new tool. You can do initial PPE assessment. So I'll use ammonia as an example. If you had an ammonia sensor, it would be good to read ammonia in several hundred part per million. But eventually it will overcome the sensor and you've reached the max range. That's where your PID can step in. Your PID can read ammonia in thousands of part per million. And so that's the difference between can I respond to this in my turnout and an SCBA or do I need to be in a level A suit? So it helps you determine your initial PPE dress out. It's also good for leak detection. Again, if we have a field of drums and we don't know which one's leaking, or we're in an industrial facility and we're trying to figure out which pipe, which flange, you can use your PID meter to help track that down. Perimeter establishment and maintenance. Uh, sometimes the hot zone gets big real quick. Um, down in Louisville, Kentucky, they had a train derailment and they had a butadiene car connected to an HF car. And when the contractor went to cut the cars apart, the whole thing went boom. And so the hot zone got much larger real quick. And so the first responders reset the hot zone, the warm zone, and the cold zone after that explosion occurred. Spill delineation, where's the spill going? You know, if you're on the roadway and you know you've got product coming off of a tanker or out of drums, has it entered the waterway yet? So we can find out where the spill's going. Decontamination. A lot of uh, teams, especially the CST teams, I don't know if you guys have done any work with them, but they'll use a PID on their decon line just to make sure they're getting a good decon. And then remediation. When you call in the contractors to clean up the spill, they keep scooping dirt until they don't get a sniff of VOC anymore. Okay. So here's how a PID works. It's actually an optical system, meaning it's a light bulb. And so as gas enters the instrument, it's gonna pass through this ultraviolet light. The ultraviolet light will ionize the sample, meaning it's separating the positive and the negative particles. It will then attach to the detector plate in the instrument, and then the circuit board, the motherboard in there, will turn that into a number that we can understand and show that value on the screen. So that's where we get the name photo ionization detector. It just explains how the sensor works, okay? So what does a PID measure? A lot of things. So don't let this overwhelm you. This is just a small sampling, but I wanted to track through this so you understand what kind of compounds we're talking. So really, any organic compound, so if you have a C for carbon in the name, it's likely an organic, it is an organic compound, and uh, you're gonna be able to detect that with your PID as long as the numbers match, and I'll talk about that here in a second. So the first example are your BTEX compounds. BTEX is just an acronym to list the major four components of gasoline. So that's benzene, ethylene, toluene, and xylene. We can detect all those with your PID. Your ketones and aldehydes, so compounds that are carbon plus an oxygen uh, molecule. Things like acetone, methyl ethyl ketone, acetaldehyde. Amines and amides, so carbon compounds that also have nitrogen involved, things like diethylamine, chlorinated hydrocarbons like trichloroethylene, sulfur compounds like mercaptan. So what's mercaptan? The odorant natural gas. Yeah, it's the odorant 
and natural gas. Because natural gas doesn't have a smell, the gas company will add mercaptan to give responders and residents, for that matter, uh, the clue that there's a gas leak. Uh, unsaturated hydrocarbons like butadiene, saturated hydrocarbons like butane and octane, and then things like alcohols like ethanol. There's also a few that don't have the C in there for carbon, so these are inorganic compounds, things like ammonia and the semiconductor arsine, okay? So does everybody notice the numbers in the parentheses? That's the ionization potential for each of those compounds. So keep that in mind. You would find out the ionization potential of the compound in your NIOSH pocket guidebook. Everybody familiar with that? It's the big green with the spiral bound. When you open the book, the information tracks across both pages. In that chart, there's one little number labeled as IP. Sometimes it's referred to as ionization energy, but you need to know the number of the compound so that we can know if your meter is gonna be able to detect that gas or not. And I've got several slides that explain that further. So as important as it is to know what gases you can measure with your PID, Here's some of the things they won't measure. So obviously radiation, that's a completely different technology, although Ray Systems does have sensors available for some of their instruments. So we could pick up a multi-ray pro that could do gamma radiation. A PID won't measure the components of air, like nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide. But remember, you have an oxygen sensor in your meter, so we are detecting oxygen, just not with our PID. Toxic gases like carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, sulfur dioxide, and I know that those first two examples have a C in them, which would lead you to believe it's organic, which there's part of there that's organic, but your PID is just not gonna detect those. And then next column, natural gas, like methane and ethane, and again, we see the carbon and the hydrogen bond there, but these compounds just have too high of an ionization potential to be able to be read by a PID, but we detect these with our LEL sensor for sure. Acid gases like hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, uh, other gases like freons and ozone, and I've never understood ozone. You know, if I can read oxygen, which is O2, why can't I read O3, ozone? But that's a completely separate sensor. And then in farming communities, you may have heard of dust explosions, but remember, this is a gas detector, doesn't have anything to do with dust. In fact, we wanna keep dust out of the instrument because it just makes it more difficult for the pump to pull in the samples, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about ionization potential. This is very important if you guys are responding to a call and you know you have a volatile organic compound you're dealing with. The IP, that number that was in the parentheses, that tells us if our PID sensor can read that gas or not. It's, as I said, also known as ionization energy. So if the IP, that number in parentheses, is less than the output of your PID lamp, then our PID can see that gas. So the ionization potential measures the bond strength. And again, as long as the light in our PID, the ultraviolet light is stronger than the bond of the chemical, we can break that open and read that particular gas, okay? And the ionization potentials are found in Ray Systems handout TechNote 106. I printed off a copy for you guys and I'll leave that at the end of the class. And again, you can also find that information in the NIOSH Pocket Guidebook, okay? So I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you, but this is one of the slides I want you to kind of burn into your memory so that you can remember how these numbers are gonna relate to each other. So think of it as a light bulb, because it really is, it just emits ultraviolet light. If the wattage of the gas or the vapor is less than the wattage of your PID lamp, then we can see that gas or vapor with your PID. Here's another way to look at it. So Ray Systems created three powers of lamp initially, and they have a low power lamp that's a 9.8 electron volt PID lamp. And so you'll see in the first example, styrene. Styrene has an ionization potential of 8.4. So since I'm using a 9.8 electron volt lamp, the 9.8 is stronger than the bond 8.4 that holds the styrene together. So I can break that bond, read the styrene, and get a reading. 
The same is true for benzene with an ionization potential of 9.24. 9.8 is greater than 9.24, so I can break the bond of benzene and take a reading. Same with methyl ethyl ketone at 9.54, I'd be able to break that bond and read methyl ethyl ketone on my PID. You guys are using the 10.6 lamp, okay? So you'd be able to see all three of those examples, but you'd also be able to see vinyl chloride at 9.99 because 10.6 is greater than 9.99. I can break the bond of vinyl chloride and get a reading. The next example is isopropyl alcohol at a 10.1, I'd be able to read that with my 10.6 lamp, and then ethylene at 10.5. The next power lamp, the most powerful that they make is an 11.7 lamp, and it would be able to see all six examples I've gone through so far, but it'd also be able to see high energy compounds like acetic acid at 10.66, methylene chloride at 11.32, and the carbon tetrachloride at 11.47. So you would wonder if the technology will ever go on to the point where you can detect any type of gas, but we're really stopped by that next example of oxygen, because oxygen has an ionization potential of 12.1, and it represents 20.9% 20 20 of the atmosphere. So if you had a lamp that was that powerful, your reading would be 209,000 part per million, so how would you ever know that 5 ppm of that is benzene, which is toxic to you? So we're about as far as we can go with the technology here with the three powers lamp that I've listed here on this chart, okay? So I know the question you're thinking, I'll ask it for you. Why not always use the 11.7 lamp? That way I can read everything, okay? Well, the 9.8 lamp and the 10.6 pro provide more specificity or more accuracy, if you will. The 10.6 lamp on paper, I have to say, lasts between 12 and 24 months but in the almost 22 years we've been in business, we're seeing four and five years out of that lamp, so it's fairly durable for being a glass light bulb. It costs less, so the price I have listed here, I'm not sure is super accurate, but they're less expensive, so about $220. Compare that to the 11.7 lamp, which if you know that you have industry in your area of responsibility and they're using a high energy compound, was well, first responders, then that just becomes our cost of doing business, and if we have to respond to them, then we do a cost recovery from that call. But if you need a high power lamp, you'd want an 11.7 on standby, things like methylene chloride. The reason that the 11.7 isn't good to run all the time is the lithium fluoride crystal on the top of that lamp is very susceptible to two things that degrade the life of it very quickly. The first is moisture. So just the moisture in everyday air, maybe not winter air, but everyday air is enough to start degrading that lamp, and ultraviolet light. So as it creates ultraviolet light, it's degrading that crystal to the tune of it only lasts two or three months. And that's a real number. We've seen that with some of our chemical plant customers that need to have this lamp all the time. And it costs a lot more, it's almost $400. So imagine running your multi-ray light with an 11.7 lamp, and having to pay $400 a quarter, it just becomes very expensive. So that's not a great example because um, the 11.7 isn't available in the multi-ray platform. You'd have to go to the Mini-Ray 3000 if you wanted that 11.7 lamp. So uh, just bear that in mind. If you do have some high energy compounds you might need to respond to, it would be a different instrument platform. I just use that as an example to explain the different lamp powers. So I know I just threw a lot of information at you. Do you have any questions about the PID or the VOCs? Okay. So this is another one of those slides, if you will, please burn this into your memory because this is important as well. A PID is very sensitive and very accurate. When I apply a VOC to your meter, it's gonna ramp up and give me a number. And as soon as I take that gas away, it's gonna come right back down to zero, super accurate but a PID is not selective. So just like a ruler can tell me exactly how wide a sheet of paper is, it won't tell me what color the sheet of paper is. So think about that with your PID as well. It's gonna give me a super accurate number, but it will not identify the compound. So you'd have to use different clues that may be presented to you on scene 
If you have uh, placards on the vehicle, or you have uh, MSDS sheets that you can refer to, or the plant manager has told you what has spilled, uh, use that information to help identify the chemical. Then you can apply correction factors to get a more precise reading with your PID. Okay. So what is a correction factor? Uh, it measures the sensitivity of the sensor to a specific gas. Correction factors allow us to use cheap calibration gas, a surrogate gas, if you will. They're scaling factors. So in the classroom drill we're going to run in the next segment, even though we might be able to walk through the menu and select styrene as our correction factor, it doesn't make the instrument specific to that gas. It just gives us a more precise reading based on calibrating with isobutylene. Okay? And again, just check the tech note that I printed for you, tech note 106. It's like 13 pages long, lists several hundred compounds with all the correction factors and all the ionization potentials. So that's a really good resource for you.